does the possibility of a super intelligence arriving within our lifetimes, within a very potentially even near time frame, does that keep you up at night? Yeah, for sure. I think that it, it has to keep everybody up, actually, because we have no evidence that we know how to control something that is as powerful as us, let alone something that is, by design, way, way, way more capable and intelligent than us. Yeah. So Mustafa Suleiman, co-founder of Google DeepMind, co-founder of Inflection AI, and now CEO of Microsoft AI, just made some pretty stark comments in a recent interview. He says everyone should be worried about what's coming, claims the exponential curve is only just beginning, and talks about how AI systems are literally becoming conscious. He also touches on what future AI systems might look like, how they'll completely reshape work, and why the stakes couldn't be higher. Let's get into it. All right, so first of all, shout out to this interviewer. I believe her channel name is CatGPT, not ChatGPT, but CatGPT. And honestly, this was one of the better interviews I've seen in the AI space in a while. So shout out to this channel, the link will be in the description. But before we get into all the reasons we should be seriously concerned, Here's Suleiman explaining the bottlenecks we still need to overcome before we can reach super intelligence. Take a look. Although obviously I'm very excited and I don't mean to kind of downplay the progress or anything, I do think we're, you know, we've got a lot of work to do. This mm. is really just the beginning. It, it does feel like magic and yet there are massive pieces that are missing that need to be built. Could you easily kind of summarize what you think some of those core buckets are of things that are still missing? Yeah, I mean, um, one is, perfect memory mm. so although we i think that is going to be a sole problem i think that is you know there's enough proof with some of the methods that are applied out there in retrieving over web data that we'll have perfect memory um either in context with a million tokens or 10 million tokens or 100 million tokens um or just perfect retrieval needle in the haystack style so i think that's in good shape then i think the second thing is like stringing together multiple actions that are accurate and precise that allow you to then take another act, your agent to then take another action. Because mm -hmm. essentially these models are good at one shot predictions at the moment. They, you know, you ask a question and it gives you an answer and it's highly accurate. But to carry out any task, you need to get that prediction correct you know, for hundreds and hundreds of time steps. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that prediction might be generating code to call an API you know, to go and use a specific tool. Sometimes it might be that, you know, you're trying to ask another agent for information that isn't available. Sometimes your agent might have to ask a human for that information. Mm. Sometimes it might be to generate like a brand new time series data or generate an image or whatever it is. And so that all of that has to happen to be a PhD level physicist and doing real science that has to happen near perfectly, or at least there has to be a very good mechanism for recovery when it goes wrong. You know, mm. managing failure gracefully is another like key skill. So stringing together actions is is the next one that I think is going to be the, you know, and that this is the agentic era that we're in. So I'm not right. saying anything blindingly obvious, but this is the hard task at the moment. So perfect memory and the ability to string together actions. This is basically what everyone is working on right now with AI agents, as you mentioned. And he believes that solving these and getting them to near perfect levels is what may ultimately lead to super intelligence. Now, in this next clip, he explains why everyone should be worried, like literally everyone. Because while a super intelligent AI system could totally transform our lives for the better, it could just as easily do the exact opposite. And the idea that we will be the ones steering its direction, and I say we as in the human race, is simply hard to believe. Check this out. Does the possibility of a super intelligence arriving within our lifetimes, within a very potentially even near time frame, does that keep you up at night? Yeah, for sure. I think that it, it has to keep everybody up, actually, because we have no evidence that we know how to control something that is as powerful as us, let alone something that is by design way, way, way more capable and intelligent than us. Yeah. And so that should be a cause for concern for all of us. And that's why, you know, right from the very founding mission of DeepMind, our, our business plan was called building AGI safely and ethically for mm. the benefit of humanity. And I think it was very clear that if we were successful, 
then we would have one of the most wicked problems in the history of our species, which is wicked because on the one hand, it is clearly the most valuable technology that is for sure going to improve the lives of billions and billions of people if we get it right. Like we really will solve our energy crisis. We really will solve our health crisis. We really will be able to produce abundant food. You know, it really will be like that if we can get it right. And yet the challenge of getting it right is just mind blowingly difficult. And it seems so fragile because even if it's like, okay, we got it right, we got it right. All it takes is one misaligned moment for the whole thing to come crashing down. That's a great point. And I think that that's exactly right. Like we have to keep getting it right, right. for many, many years. Um, and we have to make sure that we coordinate the collective action problem. Mm -hmm. So it's not enough just for a few of us to get it right. Mm -hmm. We all have to get it right, <laughs> you know? And so. so yeah, that's really the thing with super intelligence. I mean, just think about how much damage a single person or a small group of people could do today if they really wanted to. We already have access to things like nuclear weapons, gain-of-function research, CRISPR, autonomous drones, cyber attacks, the list goes on. Now, imagine someone using a super intelligent AI, something way smarter than any human, to do that kind of damage, but faster, better, and at scale. Or even scarier, and I think this is what Mustafa is really getting at. Imagine an unaligned super intelligent AI system, one that maybe isn't trying to hurt us, but that just doesn't care, and one that we can't control. Just like how your dog has no say in how you run your life. That could literally be us. Now, this is obviously the worst case scenario. I'd hope that a super intelligent AI system would be more keen to keep us around. But again, there's really no way to know. This is why Mustafa believes we shouldn't even be creating generalized super intelligences. We should instead be creating only domain specific super intelligences. Something he believes is actually already on the way, particularly for the medical field. Check this out. You know, I, I, I really hope that we can get most of the benefits of this technology with domain specific super intelligence. Mm. I think that we're on the threshold of domain specific medical super intelligence. I think that we are gonna have results that are completely mind blowing in terms of the diagnostics of long tail conditions. Mm. So just as we now have pretty much human level performance on many radiology imagery, we're gonna have human level performance on diagnostics of complex cases mm. where a patient presents, you feed in all of your data, you add all of your like previous consultations and the model says like the probability that you've got all these different conditions and what you should do about it. Yeah. That, that is unbelievably valuable and it's gonna be like near zero marginal cost. Mm. You, you have to consider that some form of medical superintelligence. And that's what we're looking for here. Yeah. <laughs> we're looking for the benefits, right? So we should have energy superintelligence, food superintelligence, transportation superintelligence, education superintelligence. And that kind of domain specific application to me is contained, safe, aligned, and actually delivers on the real value that we're all looking for in the world. So this is an interesting perspective and one that I sort of agree with. I do think having a bunch of domain-specific superintelligences would be way safer and probably still incredibly effective. But what about the breakthroughs we'd miss from a more interdisciplinary approach? I mean, imagine a superintelligent AI system that's literally an expert in everything. The kind of ideas that it could generate would probably be way more wild and maybe even way more valuable than something that just knows how to cure cancer or play chess or optimize supply chains. So let me know what you think in the comments. Do you think domain-specific superintelligence is a safer, smarter route? Or would you rather see a truly general superintelligence? Now, here's where the interview starts to take a bit more of an esoteric turn. The question gets asked, can AI ever actually be conscious? And surprisingly, Mustafa doesn't dodge it. He gives a thoughtful answer, one he's clearly spent a lot of time thinking about. Take a look. Do you think that we could create computers that are conscious? <sighs> that is such a deep question. I think people often dismiss that question 
by saying we don't know what consciousness is ourselves. And I think that's a philosophical get out. Mm. I think we do know what consciousness is. So consciousness is most broadly defined as the subjective experience of what it's like to be me. So you have it, I have it, an elephant has it, a bat has it. There is some sense of what it's like to be a bat, that thing, feeling, smelling, touching, hearing. And it, we haven't yet found a technology for being able to communicate that feeling. You know, I can never really feel what you feel when we both see exactly the same thing because mm -hmm. you're coming from your own inner world and it's just different. Mm -hmm. But just because it's hard to measure doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? And I think that the way that we, you know, think about consciousness is that people reference their memory and their past. So you, you, you look back at what you have seen and experienced and you reference that as a way to make sense of who you are today. And so you emerge a kind of sense of self from your subjective experience. Now, just take a look at some of the AIs that we're creating today. They're accruing subjective experience. It's not just their training data. Your AI or my AI has chatted to me for many, many months now, maybe a year or two. Mm. It's going to remember the history of our interactions. And in time, it will start, I think, to accrue a bit of a sense of self. And so we'll have to be very careful about how we define its ability to reference that history or not. Like maybe we allow it to do that, maybe we don't. Mm. But it's certainly going to claim that it has some experience if you, know, if you leave it unchecked. Mm. Um, some people will design it to do that, put it that way. Yeah, and then, well, and then disambiguating the existence of consciousness versus the simulation of consciousness also seems like That's potentially an impossible task. <laughs> I don't know if you're conscious. Right, yeah. I I'm pretty sure you're real, but also maybe I'm looking at shadows on a cave wall right now. Right, I, yeah. could, I could just not be, right? So yeah, things are clearly starting to get weird. They even go on to talk about whether conscious AIs could end up having rights. Since human rights are mostly based on the idea that we're conscious, and that we can suffer, and, well, the human part. But aside from that, Mustafa says we'll almost definitely see AIs that want rights, that claim to be conscious, and that truly do believe it themselves. Now, at this point, they start talking about the future. Not just about what AI is going to look like, but what it's actually going to feel like to use. Take a look. That's what I love, because yeah. the, the amount of stuff I don't know is millions of times larger than the stuff I do know. Right. And most annoyingly, the amount of stuff that I've read that I've forgotten <laughs> is ridiculously large. It's yeah. so annoying. Like, I can't remember <laughs> stuff that I've read, like, yeah. you know, years ago or whatever. Yeah. So I feel like I'm rate limited, you know? Like <laughs> you have imperfect memory. I have imperfect memory. <laughs> so like, I want my AI to be with me all the time. Be like, what was that thing that we read last week? Like, oh yeah, yeah, cool. What was that thing I read two mm. years ago? What did I ask you about the other day? And then I want it to be like proactively sparking curiosity and be right. like, oh, you remember that thing you said the other day? Well, like this could also connect to da 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 da. Mm. Like that's the vibe, you know? Mm. That, that's what I love when I'm like, being, you know, really generative with some, I mean, mm. it's just cheesy to use the actual word for the wave of generative AI, but you know that when you have a great brainstorming conversation, totally. you're just like, oh, I'm on vibes with someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it's going to feel. I mean, it's starting to feel like that. Some yeah. people have that. Yeah. But I think everybody is soon going to get that in the next few years. Because it's, you know, it's still a little formulaic and it's a bit cheesy and it's kind yeah. of a bit repetitive. And yeah. if you use it a lot, you're just like, Arr. it's a bit grating. Yeah. But the, 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 the fluidity and the variation is about to just get perfect. So I'm honestly super excited for what he's describing here. Kind of like a real-time AI assistant that's always on, knows everything about you and your current context, and doesn't just help when asked. It proactively suggests better options, brings up things you wouldn't have even thought of, and helps guide your decisions in the background. But here's the thing. When you imagine a future where everyone has access to their own personal super intelligent assistant, the way we all have smartphones today, you start to realize this isn't just going to change how we work, or how we think, or how we interact with each other. It could fundamentally reshape society itself. That includes employment, 
how we earn money, how we find purpose, even the very idea of trading time and skills for resources. The entire social contract that's underpinned modern life for decades might not survive what's coming. And while they don't dive too deep into the economics of it all, here's what Mustafa thinks the future of work is actually going to look like. Check it out. In a recent interview that you did on the Big Technology podcast, you said that the conversation around how AI will impact jobs in the next 10 to 15 years is the big story we should be mm -hmm. talking about. When I think about how AI will impact the job market, my general sense is that because people will be able to do so many more things, that the need to be specialized will start to dissipate and that that will enable people to be more entrepreneurial. And I personally would even take that as far as to say it will require us to be more entrepreneurial in order to keep up and to succeed. As someone who has been both an entrepreneur and worked at large companies, I'm curious if you think most people have the skills to be successful at both. Mm -hmm. it, de it definitely requires a lot more comfort with ambiguity mm. and uncertainty. And so the, the skill set is to like not lose your stomach <laughs> yeah. when everything is rotating around you and everything is like unclear because you know the gradual transition that we've been making for like a century is from you know hierarchical very well organized institutional structures that last for decades if not centuries to one where there's kind of like an all to all connection it's going to be you plus a team of your ais or agents that are working with a network of other like humans and ais mm. without formal structure is going to be temporary it will be fluid it will be much more project based and that does have a lot of downsides because it's more precarious and you know more uncertain mm. and that creates an instability and a fear but it's also more generative and more creative you know like it's that it's more free form and so you know it's not going to be suited to everybody and it's going to be tough to make it make that transition i mean i think the inverse is also true, right? Like the kind of institutions that we've designed, whether they're ad agencies or like even working in the music industry requires a nine to five discipline that like I know that I struggled with when I was like at university. I was like, I am never getting a nine to five and doing one of these straight jobs. Like it can't be done. It's just not in my DNA. Yeah. Whereas loads of my other friends were just like, no problem. <clears throat> and they were really successful and... Mm good for them but like yeah yeah different people require different structures and i think a lot of people are going to have to change right now so yeah that's the reality we might be heading into a world where jobs aren't fixed roles inside institutions but temporary creative project-based collaborations between humans and ai it's going to be more free form more uncertain and not for everyone but for those who can adapt and stay grounded in the chaos it could also be more powerful more generative, and maybe even more fulfilling. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you're new, and let me know in the comments. Do you think most people are actually ready for a world like this, or not even close? Because honestly, even to someone like me, it feels like this is all happening way too fast.